Um, hey, I'm thankful to be here today. I'm thankful to be part of an organization, the Christian Missionary Alliance, that it's global in nature and it values missions and, and sending people out to, to preach Christ. Um, so I'm very, very thankful for that. As Jeff mentioned, or Randy mentioned, we're taking a brief pause from our study of the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to look at the Beatitudes, but uh, as the Lord would have it, I think there's some tie-in uh, later in the message to Jeff's word last week about the transformative power of living in spirit-filled community. And something else that was on my heart this weekend, um, you know, that Jeff uh, prayed about a little bit, uh, in Matthew 24, Jesus says, uh, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars as he speaks about the end of all things. And later in that chapter, he says that the love of many will grow cold. And so, so my prayer for today in the midst of, of the chaos, the uncertainty, is that my love will not grow cold, that your love will not grow cold, uh, even in you know, the uncertain times, and that this message uh, will encourage you to not look at or react in fear to these wars or rumors of wars or political events, but to look first to Christ and to let him guide your response. Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the first of what we call the Beatitudes. They comprise the, the beginning of one of Jesus' most famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount. It's found in Ma Matthew chapters 5 through 7. Uh, speaking of the Sermon on the Mount, Thomas Watson, he, he writes, Here is a garden of delight set with curious knots from which you may pluck those flowers which will deck the hidden person of your heart. Here is the conduit of the gospel. Here is a way chalked out to the holy of holies. Feel free to follow along with me in your Bible or on the screen as I read the first ten verses of Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What a, what a glorious passage of Scripture that that really reveals to us and demonstrates the upside-down nature of God's kingdom. The Beatitudes are not meant to be understood as a, as a way to obtain salvation by works, to, to try to earn God's favor, to earn his love, but rather they're a description of those who follow the Lamb, of those who follow Christ Jesus. Because the reality of the gospel is that Christ didn't come to give you more work to do, but he came to do a work for you to seek and to save that that was lost, that which was lost. And in John 6, 29, Jesus says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you this morning, and we just want to open your word and, and hear from you. Thank you that your loving kindness is better than life. Therefore, our lips will praise you. Lord, would you... Speak not my words, but, but your words, Holy Spirit, today to, to allow hearts to be drawn uh, into your presence, my own included, Lord, as we read your word and, and hear your word. Amen. On one occasion, the British evangelist Smith Wigglesworth, he was on his way by train to South Wales, and he recalled being, being much in prayer on that journey, communing with God during that time, and, and the people that were on the train with him on that carriage, they, they didn't know the Lord. They, they were unsaved. And there was so much talking and joking that he was unable to, to really get in a word for Christ, unable to speak about his Savior. And so as the train was nearing the station, he got up to go wash his hands. And as he returned from washing his hands, a man jumped up out of his seat and said, Sir, you convinced me of sin. Soon others on the train car were crying out, Who are you? What are you? You convince us all of sin. Would that we were walking so near to Christ, so, so, 
so clothed with him, so close to him, that our very presence filled with the Holy Spirit would shift the atmosphere, would shift the environment around us because God would just be flowing out of us. John chapter 7, 37 and 38, the text says, on that last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And, and, and that word flows just implies freedom of movement. And so if you've ever gazed upon a waterfall, you know that it, it flows freely. It flows naturally, w- without strain. It, it's connected to, to a source of water from which it flows. And so it just, it's free. It doesn't have to work to flow. The, the source supplies it. And so just right now, you know, just um, may, may we just sit with God and let him flow freely through us this morning. May we allow him to flow through our hearts, that we would touch not only ourselves, but, but touch others as well. So the focus of this sermon is the first beatitude, uh, but I do want to hit on something that I think is vital before we delve into that and look and examine what those first couple verses in Matthew 5 say about Jesus, say about Christ. So I'm going to read those two again. Seeing the crowds, he went up on, a mount, on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. So whenever we see Christ's words in Scripture, we, you know, we can pay special attention. All of it is the Word of God for us, but you know, paying special attention to what Christ said. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips, Psalm 45, 2. Have you ever listened to someone whose very gaze, whose very presence transforms your gaze, transforms how you see them? People were drawn to Jesus. They were drawn to his life, to his teaching, to his ministry. Everything about him was captivating. They were transformed in his presence during that time, just as you and I today can be transformed in his presence. He's full of grace and truth full of grace and truth. His kindness leads us to repentance. It's his graciousness that draws us in. And then we read earlier, verse 1, it says, seeing the crowds. In the, in the Greek, that word see, it can mean to see physically, but it can also mean to discern clearly. Jesus perceives our, our emotions. He perceives uh, our spirituality. He perceives everything about us. He, he discerns us. He, there's nothing foreign to him about who we are or about what we've done. And Revelation chapter 1, which, as a side note, that's the most recent description that we have of Jesus in Revelation. John says, your eyes are like flames, his eyes were like flames of fire. Flames of fire. And and fire is a purifying substance. It's meant to cleanse elements of their impurities. And and Christ's gaze is like this. It undoes us. It brings us. It brings us low. John, John fell down in fear before the Lord. It shows us who, who we actually are. You know, if you consider the, the, the melting of gold, over 1,900 degrees Fahrenheit is what it takes to melt gold. That's hot. That's the extreme heat that it takes to melt gold, and, and Jesus' gaze is like that. It undoes us. It brings us to the knowledge that we are sinners. So, so I don't think it's a mistake that the first phrase of this great sermon tells us that Jesus sees us. It, it was Nathaniel of whom he said, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree. And Nathaniel immediately cries out, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He is the God who sees. All those times when you wanted to be seen by, by your father, by your mother, by your sister, by your friend, by your brother, by your roommate, by your coach, God saw you. And so wherever you are today, whatever frame of mind you find yourself in, whatever voices are echoing around in your head or or around you, whatever pressures are descending upon you, let let me speak this over you. God sees you. He's not blind to your frame, to your humanity. He sees all of you and all that you are. It was not you who first loved him, but he who first loved you. If you are in Christ, it is because of Christ. If, if God, if the Holy Spirit's drawing you near to Christ, it's because of Christ. It's because of Him. So, so don't neglect so great a salvation, so great a fellowship. We have the opportunity to commune with Him, to connect with Him. 
because he's still speaking today in that still small voice. Child, I see you. I see your pain. I see your hurt. I see that you've been overlooked. I see that you've been passed over. But I have not overlooked you. Come to me, you who are weary, and I will give you rest. He's a good father, a good, good father. So even this morning, just, just let the word of God wash over you. Let it, let it soak over you. Um, let him permeate, his love permeate the depths of your soul. Even this week, don't, don't try to fight the battles that, that you think he wants you to fight. If you haven't communed with him enough to know that the only thing you have to strive for is to enter his rest. Not trying to earn that love through enough Bible reading or enough, you know, trying to do kind things, but resting in him and allowing him to fill you, fill you to overflowing so that your presence, your very presence would shift the atmosphere just as it did in the case of Smith Wigglesworth on that train to South Wales. So I've titled this message, Releasing Relevancy, Releasing Our Need for Relevancy. And with that, let's dig into the first beatitude. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? When we think of poverty, perhaps we think of somebody with, with torn clothes begging for food, or perhaps your definition is just someone who needs assistance with rent or food for their children. Regardless of your definition, the word poor carries with it the connotation of dependence. We're dependent on someone else to provide for our needs. And there's multiple Greek words in the New Testament that are used and translated to poor, but this one in particular means abject poverty. It means not, not somebody who just needs a little assistance before their next paycheck. It means someone who is destitute, who is desperate. They're unable to care for themselves or for their physical needs. There was a movie that came out a few years back. Uh, it's called Hacksaw Ridge. It details a young medic's heroics uh, on the battlefields of World War II um, in, in Japan and in kind of the Pacific theater. And the soldier's name was Desmond Doss. And I had the opportunity to watch an interview with him in real life. A few, you know, it was a recorded interview, but when he was older and his poverty of spirit, his humility, if you will, it was just, it was, it just you know, it was palpable uh, through the interview, uh, just seeing that. And uh, he came of age during the war, uh, but he had a strong conviction that he shouldn't take life. And so even with that conviction, he felt like he should serve. He felt like he, he wanted to, to give something to his country and serve and help those around him. He would later refer to himself as a conscientious cooperator instead of a conscientious objector. And, and you can read more of the, the details of the story uh, later if you have a chance, but like I said, he came of age during the war. God opened the door for him to serve. The Pentagon allowed him to serve uh, as a medic uh, without, without holding a weapon during the war. And he served in the Pacific Theater. During this specific battle, uh, the U.S. was unable to secure uh, the ridge in Okinawa, Japan. And so, you know, they, they pulled back for the time being. But Desmond Doss stayed up there. And there were dozens of wounded men that he went from man to man, even under constant mortar fire, to, to help them. And he remembers praying, Lord, help me get just one more. Lord, help me get just one more. And he didn't even have enough rope to get him down. But the Lord brought to his mind a double bowl and knot. Some of you may have heard of the bowl and knot. A double bowl and knot that he learned as a child. And so he was able to lower them to safety so that other soldiers could come and get them and take them to the medical tent. When it was over, he had saved the lives of about, about 75 men atop that, that ridge known as Hacksaw Ridge. And there's a, mo there's a line from the movie, and I, I can't verify the historical accuracy of, of this particular line, but I think it, uh, it just exudes um, the spirit that Desmond Doss was trying to create, that, that the glory should not go to him, but to God. And you see the scene, and there's um, all these soldiers that are in the medical tent, and the, and the commander walks in, and he says, who did this? And a soldier responds to him, and he says, the coward, referring to what Desmond Doss had been labeled during his initial training. And, and that part's accurate. He, he was rejected, he was mocked, he was belittled during his initial training in the army because of his beliefs. He didn't seek to exalt himself. He was not seeking to be prominent or relevant to the culture. And, and that much is really evident from, from his life, from, from those who knew him. And, and though he was mocked and rejected initially, 
God, God honored him, protected him, and he eventually exalted him in that place. There's a documentary uh, that shares reports of Japanese snipers who had him in their sights only for their gun to jam at the last minute. So when he put himself out there and he made himself low, he, he was putting himself in a place where he could not care for himself. God protected him and honored him. And the glory went to God because his, his fellow soldiers knew that he was dependent on the Lord. They saw him praying. They saw him reading the word. Jesus said, unless you become like a child, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Beloved, we, we must have this understanding that, that we are nothing on our own. We're but dust. Even our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Nothing we can do uh, can gain us salvation. As children of God, all that we are is because of Christ. And I think 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 28 and 31 says it well. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. If God receives the glory, it doesn't matter what, what other people think of this of us. Desmond Doss knew this well. A Christian who is who's poor in spirit is not one who's perfect. But but they daily recognize their sin. They confess it to God. They turn to him, they repent and turn to him, knowing that the blood of Christ is efficacious, it's effective. Their sin will be blotted out, and communion with God will be restored. The heart that is poor in spirit is a heart that's undivided. It doesn't think that it does well at times and worse at others. It recognizes that even its righteous acts, even its acts of kindness, are soiled and stained by sin. It recognizes that it deceives itself, that it cannot know good, except that God is good. It cannot know love, except that God is love. And it cannot know the way of life, except that God has shown the way. That's the essence of poverty of spirit, that in ourselves we have nothing, but in Christ we have everything. So, so how do we cultivate this poverty of spirit? How do we live as those who are poor in spirit? And the simple answer is it's, it's of the Lord. Um, we, don't, we can't change ourselves. Romans 12, 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God does the transforming, not us. The Holy Spirit gives, gives us, gives his children an understanding and awareness of their acute need for him so that we, we come to him. Because if we're not poor in spirit, it would be impossible to receive Christ because in receiving Christ, we're admitting that we, we cannot do it on our own. We cannot do it by ourselves. Faith and poverty of spirit are, are really connected. They're, they're entwined because faith says, I'm not enough. I need someone else or something else to do something for me, to save me, because I can't do it myself. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter if you've, if you've suffered little or suffered much. You know, I think surely greater suffering allows the opportunity for the soul to, to experience greater um, communion with Christ in, in those moments. But the, but the question is not who has the roughest story or who has the craziest testimony. The question is, were you faithful? Were you faithful? And it's not, it's not a striving after faith. It's not trying harder to, to have this faith, to get it. But it's looking to God because he's inviting us to come to him. And you just have to bring yourself. That's all you have to bring and let him transform you. The 22nd chapter of Matthew, Jesus tells a parable about a wedding feast. And um, the, the king invited people to come to his wedding, but they didn't come. And so the king told his servants, hey, go out to the highways and the byways. Go invite all that you can find. And the good and the bad showed up, the text tells us, the good and the bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. And there was a man in there uh, that when the king came up to him, he said, you don't have clothes on. You don't have wedding clothes on. And he told his servants to cast him out. 
but, but the text is clear that, you know, the text implies that it was, it was the king who clothed the others who would not have been able to clothe themselves. That they wouldn't have been able to provide their own clothes. It's God who clothes us. It's Christ who clothes us. And he even clothed Joshua the high priest. If, if you remember that story from Zechariah chapter 3, Joshua the high priest is standing before the throne of God and Satan is right there accusing him and saying, he's filthy, he's dirty. And God tells the angel, take off his filthy rags and put on him a white robe. God didn't, God didn't dispute the fact that he was filthy. If anybody could be considered holy, certainly it would have been you know, the high priest. But God didn't dispute that fact that, that he was filthy. But it was God who said, take off his filthy garments and put on him a white robe. It's God who clothes us. It's God who makes us new. And, and we're humbled and transformed through, through time and, and the presence of, of God and the presence of the uncreated one, the one who transforms Jesus. And, and poverty of spirit can seem so simple at times. Um, you know, I think even in the church, we, you know, we want to study eschatology, end times, or hermeneutics, or all these fancy words, uh, but, but we're not walking in poverty of spirit. We're not walking in, in humility. The, the, the Bible, you know, these, these Beatitudes, they don't say, blessed are the well-read, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They say, blessed, to be envied, happy, or some of the other translations, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And, and that's a promise from Christ himself that, that those who are poor in spirit will receive the kingdom. And I just want to share, like, when I was, when I was preparing this portion of the sermon, I, I just felt compelled to go to my knees and ask for mercy to love Christ more. Because I don't love him like he deserves. I, I don't love him in that way. I, I want to love him more, and I'm not, I'm not there yet, but I just, I need more grace and mercy to love him more. And so I just want to keep asking for that. And I, I just encourage you, if, if you're looking for something from God to, to give you more desire for him, go to him and ask him because he's a good, good father and he, he will take care of you. He, he does not fail to satisfy the desires of our heart, sitting with him and being with him. I, I don't want to not sin because other people might look down on me. I want to not sin because I love Christ more, because he's pure and holy and he's worthy. So the Lord help me with that. Daily turning to be with God. I know it's a, it's a daily battle. As all of you know, I know of, of confessing, of turning to God and being with him to, to reconnect. But thanks be to God that we have a mediator, that we can reconnect with him through Christ. Uh, and f- for those of you who think you have it figured out, Satan's just going to devise new ways to, to attack you and devour you and, and deceive you. Uh, be careful if you think you stand, lest you fall. I, I know I've certainly thought of that verse before and just as a little analogy if, 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 if we think we can resist temptation more easily than others you can think of a, a substance like a flammable substance like gunpowder or, or something more modern that is ignites easily it's flammable combustible so having gunpowder on, on a table do you think after after months and years of it staying dry there that it's more apt to, more able to, to resist a flame when it comes near. As long as it's wet, it resists the flame. But it doesn't matter how long it's been trying to be dry, as soon as that flame comes near, it's going to explode. For us, we need to be clothed with Christ, to be soaking with him in his presence, and he'll give us the strength to resist temptation. Otherwise, we, we open ourselves up to, to destruction. And sustaining this, um, this connection with Christ, is, it's vital to our spiritual life. Po- poverty of spirit should drive us to our knees. Prayer, prayer is really the opposite of, of what people in this result, results-centered world would consider an efficient way or efficient, but, but it's, it's a natural outlet for those who are poor in spirit. It's a natural outlet for us to go there. Um, Jesus himself... Um, Model this, Mark chapter 1, it says that he rose early while it was still dark, and he went to spend time with his father to commune with him in that place. And, and there's so much more to say on prayer than, than I really have time to in this message. It could be 
loads of sermons and study, but, but the bottom line is, is prayer should be the, the lifeblood, the, the very breath of who we are, of those who are poor in spirit. And some of you may have heard of, of Amy Carmichael. She, um, she gave her life in service to God uh, for the good of many children in India. And one of the prayers that she used to pray was, My Father, quiet me, till in thy holy presence hushed, I think thy thoughts with thee. Are, are we in that place where we can quiet our hearts before the Lord? I, I know I'm so forgetful throughout the day. I need, I need God to remind me of Christ. I need God to remind me to connect. And if you're not in that place, it, it's okay. We can pray like Amy did. My Father, quiet me till in thy holy presence hushed. I think thy thoughts with thee. Do what I cannot do for myself. Do what I cannot do for myself. It's the continual recognition of, of our dependence on God that allows us to walk as those who are poor in spirit. And so we've looked at, at what poverty of spirit is, you know, in its essence, it's dependence on God, full dependence on Him. That in ourselves we have nothing, in Christ we have everything. And then we looked at, you know, how do we cultivate this in our lives? How do we walk as those who are poor in spirit? Well, it's, it's a continual connecting. It's not just that first time. It's, it's a continual connecting with God and running back to Him and, and through prayer. You know, Paul says, pray continuously. Pray continuously. So, what, so what's the result of poverty in spirit? We'll look at that now. What is the result of living in a community uh, with those who are poor in spirit? Is living as those who are poor in spirit? Short answer, it's, it's a kingdom of heaven, as the verse says. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But it would take, you know, it would take, again, Many, many days to go through to even scratch the surface of what, what the kingdom of heaven entails and, and all of that is. But I think, I think we can agree that at least a portion of it is, is just experiencing the fullness of what God has for his children, experiencing joy in his presence and, and allowing that, that life to flow through us as we interact with others, as conversations arise and people experience the love of God through uh, a broken earthen vessel such as ourselves. And living in an environment um, with those who are, who are poor in spirit is, is really transformative. It's transforming. Uh, there were a couple of people who considered themselves prominent in the world's eyes. Um, Henry Allen, he was a uh, Catholic priest who paced the halls of Yale and Harvard um, as a professor. And the Lord said, the Lord told him, go and live among the poor in spirit and they will heal you. And he spent the last years of his life living among the mentally handicapped. And you can read about just the transformation that took place in his own heart. Not just him, him blessing them, but him being changed. And another lady named Heidi Baker who, lives in, who has a ministry in Mozambique for children. Uh, she had a PhD in systematic theology. And she felt like God was calling her there to, to work with kids. And she told God, I, I've got a PhD in systematic theology. I, I don't do children. And God said, you do children now. And, and you, can read about, you can read about their stories and, and just how changed both of them were just by being among those who were poor in spirit, who recognized how low they were, who recognized their need for a Savior. John 10.10, 10, Jesus came that we might have life and that we might have it to the full. God desires to, he, he desires to give us mercy. He desires to, to forgive us, but that's not all. He desires us to experience healing in, in every area of our lives. And when we're, we have a chance to be vulnerable, we can experience that healing. James chapter 5 says, Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. It's in that place that we can experience healing. Not only forgiveness, but also healing. And, and when we choose to be vulnerable, to be dependent, to be poor in spirit. We have the opportunity to be transformed in the presence of God and in these, in these trusted relationships where, where we can experience that healing. And uh, We saw that last week at the end of Acts chapter 2 where we, we saw that deep Christian community 
uh, those last few verses of Acts chapter 2 after, after Peter preached the gospel. And, and, and let me qualify this. It doesn't mean you need to share everything with everyone. That, that would not be wise or healthy. But, you know, there, there's, it, it can be damaging to share with people who don't, don't respond in, in a healthy manner to you. But when we have the opportunity to, to share our heart, you know, like David did in the Psalms, to, to share with other people and, and be loved in that place of weakness, to be recognized in val- as valuable in that place of weakness, that's where the transformation takes place. And, and if you're unsure how God feels about you, you're, you're going to hesitate to go back to him, especially after you sin. You're going to hesitate to go to that place, and that's going to hinder your relationships. It's going to hinder connection. And, and I know that from experience. But... But if you know how high and wide and long and deep the love of Christ is for you, then even in your brokenness, you're going you're gonna to recognize that the safest place to be is in his arms. And, and you'll run with confidence to be there. Romans 5.8, But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the gospel that we preach. God, seeing you, seeing your filth, seeing your sin, seeing me, my filth and sin, and saying, I chose you. You're mine. She's mine. He's mine. It's as if God is saying, I I see your sin. I see everything about you that is broken. I chose you, and not only that, I chose you before the foundation of the world, that you might be holy and blameless before me in love. In our weakness, in our brokenness, God came for us. That's the gospel. The poor in spirit have no backup plan. We, we dare not trust our sweetest frame, as the hymn says, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. And our family goes through a catechism uh, at dinner time. And a catechism is not, nothing fancy. It just means it's a summary of Christian faith, a summary of Christian doctrine. And the first question of that catechism is, what is our only hope in life and death? And the answer is that we are not our own, but belong body and soul, both in life and death, to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our only hope. So what would it look like for us to live without a backup plan um, at work, at school, you know, at home with our spouse, with our brother, with our friend, with our sister, with our mother? But what would it look like for us to do that? I think, I think it has to begin and end with prayer. That's where it starts. Uh, a few years ago, I began praying a portion of, of a covenant prayer. It's called what's well, called the covenant prayer. It's attributed to John Wesley, and um, a portion. The first portion of it goes, "I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you, laid aside for you." exalted for you, or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. John Wesley trusted Christ's leadership in his life. And so church, let let me close with this. Christ warrants our trust. His leadership is perfect. He loves us in our weakness. He's not some fragile, vacillating high priest, changing high priest but one whose blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It's not the blood of bulls and goats shed for you. It's the blood of the Holy One of Israel shed on your behalf, on the behalf of us. We are His. And you can say, you know, you can say, oh, let me wait a little longer. Let me enjoy my sin a little more. Now, the the offers for today, and, and we spoke about the parable of the wedding feast earlier, if you're invited to a wedding, even in today's age, usually they, they, they'll send a card with a date on it. And when you're invited to a wedding, you have two options. Two options. 
can say yes or you can say no. One thing you cannot do when you're invited to a wedding is say, no, I'm, I'm good right now. I'm enjoying myself. I'll come to your wedding in a few years. Because the wedding will be over. The food will be rotten. It'll be gone. This is the opportunity you have. And Christ says, come. He doesn't require that you be fit and clean. As the hymn says, all the fitness he requires is that you feel your need of him. You just need to know that you need him to come be with him. And he will satisfy the desires of your heart. He gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And he will fill those who are poor in spirit. He doesn't require that your love be strong. Uh, Your love can be weak. I know my love is weak. But he doesn't despise real love. And he will fill those who humble themselves so that they can flow and the Holy Spirit can flow through them knowing that in themselves they have nothing but in Christ they have everything. Amen. Amen.